Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Security Shorts with Scott. Uh, today, super excited to have a very special guest. Be a little bit different format, as everyone knows. We try to keep most of our videos sort of under 10 minutes uh, with three or four or five questions. Uh, but today, we have General Keith Alexander. Uh, he's on my board. Uh, he's also on the board of Amazon. Uh, he is uh, a four-star general, and he started and ran U.S. Cyber Command for the U.S. government which is the offensive and defensive capabilities uh, for the U.S. government. He has an understanding of geopolitics and how that impacts cyber that is incredibly unique. Uh, and so I'm very excited to welcome General Keith Alexander to the uh, call today, to the, to the podcast. Uh, welcome, General. And usually we go back and forth a little bit, but I know you've got a lot of uh, interesting insights onto what's happening right now uh, with Israel with the Ukraine war and how that impacts cyber. So I'll just kick it off to you and just say, can you just start a little bit with uh, what's happening from a geo geopolitics side and how that um, is going to impact cyber in the future? Thanks for that introduction. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about the geopolitical environment that we're in today. And then I'm going to morph that over into what that means in cyber. I'm going to start with what happened on 7 October in Israel and with Hamas. You know, if you listen to FBI Director Chris Ray's discussion to Congress after that, he said the reality is that terrorism threat has been elevated throughout 2023. But the ongoing war in the Middle East has raised that threat of an attack against Americans in the United States to a whole new level. That includes cyber. From my perspective, this is the most perilous time for the United States since World War II. Why? Well, let's talk about the powder keg that's in the Middle East and the actions of Iran, Russia, and China around that. On 7 October of this year, everyone knows Hamas attacked Israel by breaching seven different areas in the Gaza fence into Israel. They started out with a number of rockets, 3,000 rockets fired, and they killed over 1,000 civilians over 270 military, and over 58 police officers. In the small towns around Israel called kibbutz, over 270 were killed in one town, Rain, uh, or Rain, the uh, musical festival, 200 and some at Kafar Azah, one of the kibbutzim, and over 130 at Biri. Those at the Kafar Azah and Biri, 80% were tortured, mutilated, raped, and killed. At Raim, it was a musical concert, over 270 killed there, as I said earlier. That musical concert was for young people. They were completely unarmed, and they were massacred. These are civilians that were killed. And Hamas took over 240 hostages. Now, why did they do this? The leadership of, ha of Hamas is Hania, who is the political leader. He was the leader in Gaza. 2017, he left. Yahya Sinwar took over as the political leader. And Mohammed Daif took over as the military leader. The military leader, Mohammed Daif, has a history with Israel. He's lost his wife and family to attacks back and forth. And he was the mastermind behind this whole conflict. What people believe he's trying to do is incite a greater war between the Arab states, Iran, and Israel to help get greater traction for Palestine. And so he wants it to look like they're the victims. And that's what they're trying to do today. It's interesting that they, he, Mohammed Daif, did not tell Ismail Haniya, the guy in Qatar, who is the political lead for Hamas, the timing of this attack. It's also interesting to see that Hamas trained in Iran in September timeframe. They had over 500 people training with the IRGC CODS force. If you think about the IRGC CODS force, we'll come back a minute on that with Hezbollah, but Soleimani, the guy who was killed in 2020 by the US, was the leader of the IRGC CODS force. And they are the ones that do most of the terrorist attacks 
in the region. They're the leaders for it. Their new leader, Esmail Kahani, was in that training group with his uh, with Hamas. So you have Hamas doing this attack. In the north, in Lebanon, you have Hezbollah. Hezbollah was created in 1982, uh, and they worked closely with Iran at that time. Iran sent 1,500 of their IRGC military to train uh, Hezbollah. And that what quickly followed was attacks against the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, 1983, the U.S. Marine Barracks in October 1983, killing over 200 Marines, the U.S. Embassy annex in Beirut again in 84, hijacking of TWA Flight 847 in 1985, and the Kobau Towers attack in Saudi Arabia in 1996. My experience, having worked in the region, Hezbollah was the greatest threat to the Gulf states. That's a key thing. The greatest threat to the Gulf states was Hezbollah. In Lebanon, they have over 1,000 fighters and over 1,500 rockets and uh, over 150,000 rockets. Some say up to 300,000 rockets on the Northern Front. So you have these two groups. It's important to see Hamas. Well, what's Hamas got? Hamas is a Sunni organization. Hezbollah is a Shia organization. Hamas has partnered with, Israel, or with Iran in the past on many of these attacks. And it came out of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood wanted to overthrow Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. So their intent was the same as Hezbollah and Iran. And so when you think about this and you look at what's going on in the region, you add in Fatah and the West Bank, you see now the groups that are affiliated with Iran leading these attacks against Israel, and why the Gulf states are they clearly don't want injury, nor does anyone, to the peaceful Palestinian people. But Hamas is using them as a human shield. This is a huge problem for the world. And I don't believe there's an easy way for Israel to get the over 200 hostages back without pushing and shrinking down Hamas fighters. They've got to do something on that or this will go on forever. And there are many who have said, if we don't, if this isn't solved here, It'll be solved in Europe and the United States, and we can't let that happen. Add to that, I mentioned that Iran sent 1,500 uh, military in to help train Hezbollah in the 80s. Recently, Syria, at the behest of Russia, is providing a Russian-made missile defense system for Hezbollah. And guess who's going to help deliver it? The Wagner Group, or the Wagner Group, depending on where you're from. And Iran maintains over 55 military bases in Syria. So that's the connection. You can see Iran is very deeply involved in what's going on and trying to, and to pull it all together. And why this makes it so important for our nation is the fact that if this explodes into a greater war, you have Russia helping Iran, Russia working with the Wagner Group, China, I'll bring them in in a little bit, has a game to play here. First, let's talk uh, briefly about Iran. Um, the Iranian defense minister threatened the United States amid these relentless bombings in Gaza. Mohammad Reza Ashtiani uh, said that if you don't stop it, we're going to do something about it. We should take that very serious. We know that Hamas, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, and others have already threatened to attack the U.S. Those are attacks we see in the future coming at us and at Europe. In Iran, when you look at the leaders, the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, spells a little bit different than his predecessor. Uh, I think they all have Ks and they go from there. Um, he's been in charge for 20-some years, 30 years now. Uh, of, of somewhat questionable health. One of the guys who they think would replace him is Ibrahim Raisi. This guy's a bad guy, in my opinion. In 1988, he, along with three others, were the judgment panel, the people who actually judged those that should die because they disagreed with the regime, focused on the Mujahideen call. They killed over 10,000 
of their own people by hanging. Raisi was one of the four that condemned them to death and to hang, and they hung 10 to 30 a day over a long period of time. Think about that in different areas. So he's not a good guy. And when I look at this, what I'm concerned about is they want at all at the top of their list to wipe out the Israeli state. The same objective that Hamas has, that Hezbollah has. And you look at this, and why is Russia involved? Well, Russia and Iran don't always get along. When you look at the Caspian Sea, Russia has been going after Estonia in 2007, Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014. They took over Crimea. In 2022, they thought this would be a cakewalk. I'm sure that Putin told Xi Jinping, look, this is only the last three or four days. I've told him, bring your marching uniforms. We're going to march in Kiev in four days. He thought Zelensky, being a comedian, would bail out. They got it wrong. They didn't have the supplies, the training, the military force, or the planning that they needed to conduct this attack. And the rest is history. So they've been hammered by the Ukrainians who are fighting for their lives and their nation. Zelensky has done a great job. We're now in a standoff. You look at the eastern part of Ukraine. The Russians have built about 350 miles of trenches with concrete and landmines. And that's why it's kind of a static fight. Think back to World War I. The other part that, that comes out of this, though, is Putin's future is now bound to what happens in Ukraine. And there was talk a lot about what happens if, what are they going to do? How are they going to get rid of him? Is there going to be a coup and who would take place? Three guys that could possibly take place that I could think of. Petrushev, which is his national security advisor, was the former FSB up until 2008 director. Bortnikov took Petrushev's place. So those are the top two. And uh, I think both of them are as bad or worse than Putin. They want to rebuild the Soviet Union. They believe all these satellite countries are theirs. They work for us. And he's going to do everything he can to do that. He said the Baltic states, Poland, think about all the countries that are now in NATO, he wants to attack. And he believes that NATO is actually not viable as a, as a group up until February of 2022, when all of a sudden Zelensky stood his ground, NATO came back and along with the U.S. and other European countries hit Russia with huge sanctions. Those sanctions have had a debilitating impact on the Russian economy and on Putin. And on China. When you think about this, Xi Jinping is watching what's going on in Russia and Ukraine thinking, I know we have a better military now than Russia, but we could not handle the sanctions of the magnitude that have hit Russia. This would our economy and probably those that support the Communist Party ruling China. So he's got to go slowly, I think, and make sure that what he does, he has the support to do. In the past, remember when he took over in 2012, he had an anti-corruption campaign. Think of this as how to get rid of those guys you don't like. They're corrupt, get rid of them. And they did. And a number of retired and uh, ex uh, Communist Party officials that were, weren't at his table are gone. You saw that again in 2022 when he took charge, changing the Constitution so that he would be in charge for life. And when he took charge, his background, he had a couple of things. First, he was really upset with what happened in World War II. They were embarrassed, his words, by Japan. And he has vowed that will never happen again. They're going to rebuild their military, and they are on a plan to do that. They have come out hard against the Japanese, and he said, we're going to take back Taiwan. 
Those are the three things. And now in order to do that, he's got to build back his economy. And you can see right now they're having a tough time building back their economy. What do they need to do? Well, the One Belt, One Road initiative. And their intent was to grab the resources they need from Africa and other countries to help fuel the economy of China. A brilliant plan. However, earlier this year, President Biden, along with the leader from India and Saudi Arabia on the uh, G20 conference around that, got together and said, why don't we build a conduit between India and the Middle East, the Middle East and Europe. That directly competes with the One Belt, One Road initiative. There are some that say that China actually helped push Iran to do this. Now, what's the connection between Iran and China? Well, three years ago, China came up with a great idea. They told the Iranians, we'll give $400 billion over 25 years for access in for a number of contracts in oil and gas, which they need. And in uh, doing that, we'll also then give you things like uh, better access to military. And we'll have, we'll do to joint efforts together. And these things include air and naval support and a whole series of things with the military elements, along with giving them money every year. So we now see that all these are now bound together. Russia, China, Iran, and Israel is at the forefront trying to defend their, their nation. If we don't stop that here, we're going to stop it in Europe or in the Pacific or here in our homeland. And there's a lot that's going on on this with respect to the cyber world as well. When you look at the cyber engagements in uh, what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, there have been a series of attacks and most recently destructive attacks into their critical infrastructure. Here in our country, we've seen the Chinese get into our critical infrastructure, the water and other things, getting access and being prepared for a future fight. China has said that if they fight a technologically superior country, that's us, they would start with cyber warfare. And Iran has been hitting Israel with a number of attacks. Some of those attacks, like what happened in 2017 when the GRU hit Ukraine tax interests, will leak out and go global. And you'll see that hit things beyond MGM, beyond casinos, to small, mid-sized, and large companies here in the U.S. So that gets us back to really the heart of the discussion today, and that is how do we now defend together? And the answer for large companies that can put a lot of money into us, that's a pretty easy thing. For small and mid-sized, you need help. You need to work together. I think that's where Soul Cyber and what they're doing, what our team, Scott and company, are doing there is how do we get world-class capabilities for small and mid-sized companies and start them working together and get the protection they need in the future? Because it is clear in my mind, we're going to end up coming out of the conflict in the Middle East with greater terrorist attacks and greater cyber attacks into our nation. We've got to get ready for it. And so that's what Scott and I are all about. And so Scott will now go over a little bit more in detail on what Soul Cyber does and how that would benefit you. With that, Scott, over to you. Awesome. Thank you, General. Um, everyone will obviously cover some of the Soul Cyber things, but uh, uh, the General has a perspective that's just not easy to get uh, if you're uh, a layman in the world. Um, his background in um, not just the military, uh, but obviously in the cyber side uh, and what he's seen and his um, ability to still stay connected um, is unique. So hope everybody found that useful. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how um, we're seeing this cyber threat continue to evolve. Uh, in the last three months, we've been told consistently that's one of the worst three months uh, in the past many, many years uh, from a cyber standpoint. Uh, but with that, General, I appreciate the time and the uh, the information as always and look forward to talking with you again soon, sir. 
Yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks for what you and Soul Cyber are doing. Great work. You got it. Cheers.